Welcome to Wednesday night prayer time and Bible study. This is certainly new territory for me and I'm sure for you too. Normally at this time, we would just be finishing our Wednesday night supper. We'd be gathered here in the auditorium for our prayer service and for our uh, Bible study time. But obviously, these are not normal times or not normal conditions. Our regular routine has been greatly altered and for the most part shut down completely. But this interruption in our regular schedule has given me, and, and I pray it has given you, an opportunity to reflect on our past and perhaps reevaluate our future and what our goals and plans are for the future. So let us not focus on our past, but let us focus on the future and ask God to make us more like Jesus. More like Jesus, a better Christian, a better husband, a better wife, a better mother, a better father, a better son, a better daughter, a better member of Shaw's Creek Baptist Church. So I say to you, Shaw's Creek, I thank God for each one of you. I love you with all my heart, and I miss you, long for the day, and look forward to the day when we can all be together here in this building that houses Shaw's Creek Baptist Church. I do not have the prayer list with me tonight, but those of you who are regularly on the internet and search our website, you will find an up-to-date prayer list each week. If you have that prayer list, I ask you to take it now and look it over, and we shall pray for those, even though we don't pray for them by name, we'll pray for everyone on that prayer list. Thank you for tuning in, and I pray that this Bible study time will be a blessing to you each Wednesday afternoon at this time, Wednesday evening at this time, until we can all be together back in God's building here at Shaw's Creek. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you now for the great joy of your salvation. Thank you for bringing us to this place. Thank you for giving us the freedom to preach and the freedom to listen and the freedom to worship you. Thank you for the great nation that you've given us the privilege to be a part of, the United States of America. Thank you for our president, and we pray especially for him as he is leading this, this world, actually. He's leading this world, and especially our nation, in this terrible fight against this disease that none of us can see, but is so real in all of our lives. We all know someone that might have been affected we know the statistics that we see on the print media and on television. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll bless President Trump and the task force and all of our leaders as they lead us through this difficult time. Now, Lord, I pray for those on our prayer list tonight. You know each one by name. You know each one, the problem that they have. You know the reason. Their names are on the Shaw's Creek Baptist Church prayer list. And I pray that you will look at each one, and may your will be done, and may Jesus be glorified in all that we see and do. Thank you for this time of Bible study. Guide us in this time of study, we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. We are studying the book of Ecclesiastes on Wednesday night. Ecclesiastes is the word for preacher. It's the Greek word for preacher. And the theme of this book, most folks would say written by Solomon, the theme is Solomon's desire to find meaning to life. And we've called this entire study Searching for Meaning to Life. In chapter 1, we see that Solomon was going around in circles, going around in circles. He couldn't find out what his real meaning in life was. He says, nothing is changed, nothing is new, and nothing is understood. That was in chapter one. And then in chapter two, we entitle chapter two, a search for a satisfying life. And a satisfying life, number one, Solomon said, it begins when we test life. And then it continues or changes when we face life. And then a satisfying life ends when we accept life as God has given it to us. 
Today we come to chapter 3. Chapter 3 I've entitled, Everything Beautiful in His Time. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we find in verse 11 that the writer says, He, that is God, hath made everything beautiful in his time. And the word time can also be translated timing. So the Bible says that everything will work together for good and everything will be beautiful in God's timing, in his timing. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, everything beautiful in his time. Life is a series of mysteries. Life is a series of mysteries. Cancer is a mystery. Wars are a mis mystery. Untimely deaths of our mothers, fathers, or even children is a mystery. Alzheimer's disease is a mystery. And I could name others, and you could too. But life is a series of mysteries. Right now we have the mysterious covert 19, COVID-19, the coronavirus. And that is a mystery. We don't know where it came from. We know the region it came from, but we don't know how it originated exactly, and we certainly don't know how it's going to end. Solomon, the wisest man on earth, in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes, he looked at the life that he was living, and at life in general, through human eyes. And when he looked at life in human eyes, he concluded that life was no more than what's left after a bubble is broken and goes into thin air. Soap bubbles, chasing after the wind, as Solomon said. And he said, therefore, life is meaningless and monotonous. But by chapter 3, Solomon begins to change his mind. In, in chapter 3, Solomon looked at God, th looked at life not through his eyes or through human eyes, but through God's eyes. And he discovered in looking at life through God's eyes, he discovered that God has an unrevealed plan that man cannot know. That unrevealed plan is the will of God. God's will is found in this unrevealed plan. plan. Solomon discovered four truths that proved that God is still in control. And that's what we want to explore this evening are these four truths. Now, we won't get to all four tonight. We'll only get to two of them, and we'll pick up the other two next week. But Solomon discovered four truths that proved God is still in control. In verse 11, Paul says, We will never be able to understand the mysteries of life and the pain down here. In 11, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 11, Solomon says, No man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. He will do everything he wants to do in his time and in his timing. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see through a grass, glass darkly, but then we see face to face. Now I am known in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. So let's look at these four truths, two of them tonight and two on next Wednesday evening. Truth number one, when we look through the eyes of God, we discover, number one, that there is someone above man who is sovereign. Now, the word sovereign simply means ultimate authority, supreme authority, the one in charge. There is someone above man who is in charge, and that is God. In verse one of chapter three, Solomon says, to everything there is a season and a time. Now, we understand the natural laws of nature. They are regular. They're a part of life. God is moment by moment accomplishing his purpose, his will, even though, even though we do not know what it is as time goes on. In verses 1 through 8, God reveals 14 mysteries of life that as we look at them, and examine them, we will see that they are part of his unrevealed plan, which is his will for this world and for our lives. So let's look at these 14, one at a time. Number one, we see the sovereignty of God in birth and death. 
This is found in verse 2. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to be born and a time to die. You see, when we see abortion, cloning of babies, birth control, mercy killings, test tube babies, we tend to think that, that the birth of children is in our hands and not God's hand. It looks as if man is in control of life and death, but that is not the truth. Listen, God said to Joshua in Joshua 24, 3, I, that is God, took your father Abraham and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And then in Psalm 113, verse 9, he, that is God, maketh the barren woman to be a joyful mother of children. Galatians 4, 4, Paul said, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. So we may foolishly hasten our death, but we can never postpone it. I've quoted this verse many times, and you'll hear it again. Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So the sovereignty of God is seen first in birth and death. Secondly, the second mystery, we see the sovereign of God in planting and plucking. This is also found in verse 2. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Being an agricultural people, the Jews understood the seasons for planting and harvesting. We here in western North Carolina are, are blessed with four seasons. The brown of winter becomes beautiful in the spring, as it is beginning to show now. And in the spring comes summer. And after the hot summer comes the leaf season. The beautiful green of spring becomes the beautiful colors of autumn. Number three, we see the sovereignty of God in killing and healing. This is found in verse three. A time to kill and a time to heal. Now, killing here does not speak of war. This is not speaking of war, but this is a result of sickness and plagues and disease such as cancer. 1 Samuel 2.6 says, The Lord killeth and maketh alive, like the coronavirus that we're fighting now. You see, God permits some people to die, and he permits some people to be healed. He is in control, and we don't understand. No one understands why God allows some people to die and allows others to live. But everything will be beautiful in his timing. The Bible guarantees that in the end, it will all make sense and it will be beautiful in his timing. Mystery number four. We see the sovereignty of God in the breaking down and building up. This is in verse three. Verse three, there's a time to break down and a time to to build up. Some people will be built up. Some people will prosper. And everything they touch seems to turn to money and to wealth. And then others will work hard and do the best they can, but they never can seem to get ahead. We don't understand why that happens. As a pastor, I've, I've often wondered in, my, in the congregations where I've served why this person would be wealthy and this person would be poor. They both work hard they both love the Lord, and they're both doing the things that they believe are right. But it's not my, not my place to know, because the Bible says there's a time for breaking down and building up. And one day, everything will be beautiful in his time, in his timing. Mystery number five. Mystery number five. A time for weeping and a time for laughing. In verse number Four, a time to weep and a time to laugh. Well, that's, that's pretty easy to diagnose, isn't it? In sorrow, we cry, and in happiness, we laugh. How many times have we cried, and how many times have we laughed? Sometimes we cry and think that we'll never be able to laugh again, but we do laugh, and while we're laughing, we hope we'll never cry again, but we do cry. There's a time to laugh, and there's a time to cry. And then mystery number six in verse four, the same as number five. Sometimes we mourn and are grieving, and sometimes we're so happy that we're dancing. And then there's mystery 
Number seven. This is found in verse five. A time for casting and gathering. Verse five says, A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. There's an old Jewish fable that goes like this. It, it, the old Jewish fable says that God, when he was creating this earth, he took two of his angels and he gave them all the rocks that would be distributed throughout all the world. But one of the angels, as they went over Palestine, Israel, they dropped all of their load of rocks, half of the world's rocks they dropped in Palestine. Of course, that's a, that's a fable, but there, it is a very rocky place. And so the rocks had to be cast away and gotten off of the ground before the crops could be planted. Now, if you wanted to hurt your enemy in those days, you would gather up rocks and go at night and fill his field full of rocks. The Bible has something to say about that. Second Kings 3.19, God gave Israel instructions for defeating the country of Moab. And this is what he said. Mar every good piece of land with stones. Mar every good piece of land with stones. But you see, there's a time for casting and then there's a time for gathering. When do you gather up the rocks? Well, in the nation of Palestine and Israel and other places where it is a rocky terrain, you gather up those rocks and you use them. You clear the field of the rocks so you can plant crops, and then you use those rocks to make walls and to build other things. So there's a time for gathering. There's a time for casting away. And so the, the application for you and me today is this. Rocks are neither good or bad. It's how you use them. If your enemy fills your field, that is your life, if your enemy fills your life with rocks, Make something good out of those rocks. Don't throw them back at him. Just take those rocks and make something good out of them, and then everything will be beautiful in his time. Mystery number eight. Mystery number eight. A time for embracing and not embracing. A time to love, and a, a time to embrace, and a time to not embrace. In verse five. There's a time to say hello, and there's a time to say goodbye. I'll use myself as an example. I'm the interim pastor here. There was a time for me to be embraced, and you, church, have given me your love, and you have embraced me. It was a time for me to come here. We believe that it was appointed by God for me to come and be your interim pastor. But just as that time was certain, there's a certain time when I will leave. There's a time for me to come. There's a time for me to go. And everything will be beautiful in his timing. Mystery number nine. Mystery number nine. Getting and losing. Found in verse six. There's a time to get and a time to lose. A time to get and a time to lose. There's a time to search for something. And then there's a time to give it up for loss and move on. Mystery number 10. Keeping and throwing away, verse 6. There's a time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to keep and a time to cast away. Someone has said this is biblical authority for garage sales and yard sales. I'm not sure that that's what the writer meant when he put that in there, but you can make it that way if you want to. There's a time. There's a time to get things and give them away and a time to let them go. There's a time to let them go. Biblical authority for garage sales, I'm not sure about that. But listen, there's a time to turn things loose, even that you really love. I found in my experience that when parents have children who grow up to be adults, they sometimes refuse to let them leave home and be the adults. In one of my pastorates, I had a dear lady Loved the Lord with all of her heart. Still does. She had two sons and a daughter. I was privileged as they grew up to baptize them. And I was privileged to perform their wedding ceremonies. And that poor mother, bless her heart, for weeks and months would go to their rooms that they had vacated when they moved out on their own, go to their rooms and cry on their beds because they were gone. 
You see, that's not biblical. There's a time, there's a time for keeping, and there's a time for throwing away. You don't throw your children away, but there's a time to turn them loose. Mystery number 11, found in verse 7. A time to rend and a time to sow. Tearing and mending, tearing and mending. This probably refers to the Jewish practice that we see in the Old Testament when you would tear a garment when there was grief or repentance. We read many times that they would tear their garments and put dust on their head as a means of showing their grief and repentance. It means you are to sorrow when there's a time for sorrow, but you're to have joy when there's a time for joy. There's a time to get out the needle and thread and start sewing things back up after you have been sad. After you have, after you have grieved and repented, then there's a time for sewing up. A time for mending, tearing, and mending. And then mystery number 12. There's a time for speaking and remaining silent. Verse 7. A time to rend, a time to sow, and a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. That speaks for itself. There's a time to speak up. There's a time to be silent and keep our mouths shut. Mystery number 13. Loving and hating. This is found in verse 8. A time to love and a time to hate. I know what you're saying. You're asking the same question that many of us have asked over the years. Are Christians allowed to hate? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. We are to hate, but we've got to be careful what we hate. Psalm 97.10 says, Ye who love the Lord hate evil. I'll be honest with you. I hate sin. I hate sin. I hate evil. I hate a lot of things that I believe are contrary to the word of God. I believe that, that I hate disease that robs a person of their health. I hate disease that kills a mother or a father and leaves a hole in a family unit. Listen, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, the proverb says this. There are six things doth the Lord hate. Six things the Lord hates. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that uh, will be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. There's a time to love, and there's a time to hate. You see, the Iraq War, there was a time to hate the terrible atrocities that were happening in that war. And that leads us to mystery number 14, war and peace. This is found in verse 8 also. A time of war and a time of peace. A time of war and a time of peace. You see, we don't understand the multitude of wars, rumors of wars. Wars are going on all over our nation, all over our world at one time. War, war, war. We don't understand this. But, it, but think of it like this. When a doctor fills a prescription, that prescription is designed to make you well. Now, if you took each ingredient in that prescription and took it individually without all the others, it wouldn't help you at all. In fact, it might make you worse. And that's the way it is with these wars. We look at them, and they, they look terrible, and they are. But somehow in all of this, God is going to blend all of this together, and the result is going to be Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God. And so when I said at the beginning, when Solomon discovered these four truths, he's discovered them by looking through the eyes of God. The four truths. Number one, he said, the first truth is there is someone above man who is sovereign. And that is God. We looked at the 14 mysteries of life that show the sovereignty of God, the absolute authority of God, that all of this is going to work out for our good and for his glory, but only in his timing. Birth and death, planting and plucking, killing and healing, 
breaking down, building up, weeping and laughing, mourning and dancing, casting and gathering together, embracing, not embracing, getting and losing, reaping and throwing away, keeping and throwing away, tearing and mending, speaking and remaining silent, loving and hating. You see, war and peace. So there is someone above man who is sovereign, and that is God. Now, the second part of tonight's study, truth number two, there is something within man, something within man that is secure, and that is eternity. Something within man that is secure, and that is eternity. Verse nine is a repeat of verse three in chapter one. Verse, verse, uh, Verse number nine, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? You see, it, it's all worth nothing, Solomon would say, unless God is the author. And he says all of the pain that we endure is worth it because of eternity. Worth all the pain because man's life is a gift from God. Verse 10. Verse 10 says, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. The word travail is also the word burden. I have seen the burden which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in their life. So he says that man's life is a gift of God. Life may seem strange, but it's the gift of God just the same. This strangeness of life that we all experience, this strangeness of life is to be exercised. That is, we're to question and find out why is this happening? What can I learn from this? How can this help me be a better believer and a better witness for Jesus Christ? You see, Man's life is a gift from God, and we must accept life as a gift no matter what it is. Someone has said, our outlook helps to determine our outcome. So man's life is a gift from God. Secondly, man's life is linked to eternity. Now get this. This is very, very important. In verse 11, the Word of God says, No man can find out the work of God that, that God maketh from the beginning to the end. In the world, in the world, he has set the world in our heart. Now the word world, what does it mean? It can also mean eternity. Man is different from animals because, the, the, and the rest of creation because man has eternity in his heart. I am convinced that there is no such person as a genuine atheist. I'm convinced that there are many people who think they are, and I'm convinced that there are many people who try to prove that they are. People have gone to their grave trying to prove that there is no God. But inside of all human beings is built by the Lord himself and a, and a desire for an afterlife. Everybody believes that there is an eternity. Not everybody pursues it in the way that they should, but everybody deep down inside, and I believe that every person who goes to the grave goes to the grave with the idea that there is an eternity out there somewhere. Eternity in his heart. It's linked directly to heaven. Now, listen. This guarantees that we will understand all of life's mysteries. We will understand why such and such a person had Alzheimer's, or such and such a person had cancer, or such and such a person's mother died at an early age. We'll understand all of that, but only in eternity. Not in this life. We'll never understand it in this life. But we will understand it in eternity. And then thirdly, man's life is a gift from God. Man's life is linked to eternity. And thirdly, man's life can be enjoyed now. And I couldn't wait to get to these three verses, the last three verses for our study tonight. Beginning at verse 12, I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. 
Solomon concluded as he looked through the eyes of God that there's no good in all of this stuff that he's been talking about except for a man to rejoice and to do good in the life that God has given him. Verse 13. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor because it is the gift of God. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. And that doesn't mean to be afraid. The word fear there means to worship before him, to stand in awe of the goodness of God. I thank God. Listen, instead of complaining about what we don't have, let us in thank God for what we do have because we are blessed above all people. Let us thank God for what we do have. And as I was studying this earlier today, I was saying, God, what are the things that I'm most thankful for? And one of the things that I'm most thankful for is you. Shaw's Creek Baptist Church, you have accepted me. You've brought me in. You've let me be your interim pastor. You've loved me. You've fed me on these Wednesday nights. Not tonight, but usually you have. And we will again. You fed me. You've supported me. You've prayed for me. You've prayed for my wife. And you've prayed for us together. And I love you. And I thank God for each and every one of you. It is through you and others that I'm able to enjoy the life that God has given me. The trials and troubles that I face are no different than yours. They may be different in aspects, but they're all the same thing. They burden us and they cause us pain. But we do also have joy. William Sangster was a great Methodist preacher born in 1900. He was an English preacher and preached in English, England. And he came down with the terminal disease, muscular atrophy. And he made four resolutions as that disease began to take his life little by little. He said, number one, I will never complain. Number two, I will help keep my home bright. Number three, I will count my blessings. And number four, I will try to turn my sickness into gain. Now let me end tonight by asking this question of myself and also of you. And we all know what the answer is. How can life, how can my life and your life be meaningless and monotonous for us when God has made us part of his eternal plan. The 16th century Puritan pastor named Thomas Watson said this, and I want to say it twice so that you won't miss it. Thomas Watson said, eternity to the godly is a day that has no sunset. Eternity to the wicked is a night that has no sunrise. Let me say it again. Eternity to the godly is a day that has no sunset. Eternity to the wicked is a night that has no sunrise. Verse 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his timing. All that I've said tonight will all come together in God's time and he will under, may help us to understand it and we'll understand it as the song says better by and by. Everything beautiful in his time and in his time. Thank you for listening. Let's close in a time of prayer. Father, bless your word tonight. Bless your word. I pray that it will find a lodging place in the hearts of those for whom it was intended. And I give you thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.